Uh, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Live now? Let's go. Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Hooper. Uh, you can call me Hoop, and I'm, I'm damn glad to be here today at B-Sides DFW. I'd like to thank the organizers first for having me, and uh, thank you all for uh, coming out to my talk. Uh, HTTP and desync attacks. So what we, uh, what we wanted to do was illustrate, like, what is an HTTP request smuggling attack? What is desync attack? In this talk, uh, I intend to go over the basics of the HTTP protocol, uh, really take you down from, from a zero knowledge to actually understanding what a desynchronization attack is, as James Kettle popularized in, in 2019, and then revisit it again in, in 2021. So I uh, hope you all enjoy. Let's get started. First off, me. I'm Kerry Hooper. Uh, I love B-sides. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at NoPantFruitDance. Um, I'm a penetration tester on a Fortune 500 red team. Um, I have quite a few hobbies, uh, and I'm a combat veteran and West Point graduate. Um, go Army, beat Air Force. Let's go. All right, so let's get into it. HTTP. By the end of this presentation, the audience should understand, uh, one, with the basics of the HTTP protocol, how the protocol evolved, uh, how it works, and some of the more advanced features of the protocol. Uh, you should also understand uh, what is request smuggling. Uh, you may have heard about this, maybe on Reddit, maybe uh, maybe on Twitter, maybe maybe you've read about it in, in some of the uh, the bug bounty uh, write ups. However, um, this is something that I've noticed a lot of blue teamers and red teamers alike really have a tough time grasping, and that's because the understanding of that particular vulnerability class depends on two main key concepts in the HTTP protocol, which aren't really understood that well or that widely. So we're gonna go over that. And we're also gonna do a demonstration of this vulnerability, what this vulnerability actually looks like when you're actively exploiting it, and also what the uh, unintended consequences are of two HTTP appliances not really interpreting the HTTP protocol the same way. Again, this is not a vulnerability in HTTP itself. It's not a protocol issue. It's how the protocol is interpreted and enforced. And when there's a, when there's a mismatch between those the two appliances, and there's a mismatch in how it's interpreted, uh, this miscommunication can cause severe vulnerabilities. First off, let's get into a history. So HTTP, the P stands for protocol, who knew? Uh, this is a TCP protocol and it's pretty much used to fetch resources from a remote or, or local server. Uh, it's generally human readable, which means uh, it's not compressed, you know, it's not zipped. Uh, you can take a look at these packets in Wireshark, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, if decrypted, uh, and, and pretty much get an understanding of what's going on, and we're going to get into some of that. Uh, from the Mozilla documentation, this is a simple HTTP GET request. In fact, it's one of the most simple requests. Just GET a page, and, you re and the server will respond with uh, the, the actual resource requested. Any protocol is just an agreed upon communication standard. It's like, hey, can I have that thing? Why yes, why yes, client, you may have that thing. Uh, a simple response might be uh, the HTML, which is a hypertext transfer markup language. I'm not gonna get into that, I'm not gonna get into HTML or CSS or JavaScript. This is just information returned by the server and then interpreted by the browser. In an HTTP request, at its very base, uh, we have a couple of key components, and I want to get the terminology uh, correct here for, for everyone, to everyone, for everyone out there in the audience to get on the same level. Uh, first off, you have a method, also call it a verb. So some examples of this would be like get. Uh, this is going to be the first portion of the HTTP request. It could be get, post, options, um, trace, even um, delete. Um, there's a number of others uh, that are allowed and uh, even more that, are, that aren't allowed by, by RFC. And then the name of the resource, so the path of the thing requested. Some people call it a URI, though that's not actually the 100% correct term for it. And then the version of the protocol. There, as we'll see in the next few slides, there are a couple different versions of the protocol, each building on the last. And this is one of the things that's going to be extremely important for us. And then after that whole first line, there's three components all in the first line. After that first line, we have all of the headers. And essentially, the headers are metadata. They're metadata about the request. It, it, it's not really, it's not really the, um, you're not going to get a lot of data in this, but you are going to be able to influence how the client and the server 
responds to, to these messages. And then last, we have the post body, and we'll get into that in depth in a little bit. So the first mention of HTTP in a RFC, or request for comment, was in 1990 with HTTP 0.9. Now this was before there was a standard, um, you know, back, back, back way back in the 90s. I don't know how many of you in the audience were, were around tech back then. Uh, but there was, there was no headers. It, there was no single standard for the HTTP protocol. It was pretty much just a single line HTTP request and then HTML and text back. There was no JavaScript, there was no CSS, none of that. Now there are a number of different features added by different companies and different groups. However, because of that, because they were, HTTP was growing from the ground up in a decentralized manner, there's interoperability issues. Uh, a request from one, from like DARPAnet might not, might not agree with, with those in, in you know, a, a another network. So in 1996, HTTP 1.0 was introduced, and, and there, the, the key, um, it was introduced in RFC in 1945, and, and RFC is a request for comment. This is essentially a, a written standard or guideline for the protocol itself. And there's a couple key features that were added. In addition to kind of bringing everyone together to a common understanding of what HTTP should and should not be and must and must not be, um, it, it introduced a, a couple of key features, and one is the version. So now in each, in each HTTP, HTTP request, the version is mandatory, and that the latest version is 1.0, 0 0.9 being versions um, fr from the past. Additionally, it included headers. So headers were not even a thing until 1996, and again, what I said before is headers are essentially metadata, uh, information about the request, and that's both on the client side, the request, and the response from the server. And then last thing, there were these things called status codes. Some of you may be familiar with this. The status code is sent from the server to the client, and we're talking about things like uh, 200, okay, or 404, not found, uh, 403, uh, forbidden. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a number of other ones. Uh, I, go ahead and uh, I, I'd like to know what's your favorite uh, HTTP response code in the chat. All right, after that, um, version 1.1 came out a short two years later. It was outlined in two RFCs, um, and, and these are the real features that I want to cover because they're, they're some of the most important. Notice that these requests are getting more and more complex, and the features are also getting more and more complex. It added features such as the host header, which is used for virtual host routing, uh, also content negotiation, cache control, and most importantly for us, connection reuse. And this is related to HTTP pipelining, which we'll cover in depth in a bit because it's so important to desynchronization attacks. In addition, chunked encoding. Don't need to know what that is right now, but understand two things. HTTP pipelining and chunked encoding are incredibly important to understand HTTP request smuggling and these desynchronization attacks. We also need to discuss HTTPS, HTTP 2.0 and HTTP 3.0 though they're not specifically uh, required for this talk, I want you to know that they exist. Uh, HTTPS is just HTTP, which again is a human readable protocol, uh, wrapped in a layer of encryption. Uh, usually that's SSL or, or TLS, TLS 1.3 being, being one of the most recent. HTTP 2 is also a thing. Uh, this, was, uh, this was standardized in 2015. Um, I'm not gonna get into HTTP 2 specifically during this chat. I will uh, talk about some of the implications of smuggling vulnerabilities in it. However, just uh, what, what you need to understand about this is all it does is change the way that data is transported and the way headers are, um, are, are, are communicated between the client and the server. There are still headers, which is metadata about the request. There's still a message body, and there's still headers in these key value pairs. They're just compressed. Um, and they, it's faster for not just because it's compressed, uh, but for a lot of other reasons as well. HTTP 3 is still in draft. It is, uh, to my knowledge, it's not, uh, it's not solidified yet, but essentially this is HTTP over QUIC, which was a protocol developed in Google in, in 2012, which is uh, an encrypted re-implementation of TCP. All right, let's go over connections. So a uh, client goes out and makes an HTTP request. Hey, play, may I please have that document? Server comes back and says, yes, you may have that document, and here's some other documents along with it. TCP connection reuse um, was introduced in HTTP 1.1, and this is a feature that made HTTP much more efficient. 
Um, this was back during the time when e-commerce was hot. This was back in the time you know, when, when the dot-com boom was just becoming a thing. When more and more websites were popping up, e-commerce became a thing. And this essentially allowed for a more efficient use of computer resources, aka sockets. At the very basic, these connections would occur as follows. And, and take a look at this. Take a look at this uh, diagram we have here. In the in short-lived connections, there's one request, one TCP connection, a SYN, a SYN ACK, and then an ACK, and then the HTTP request, the HTTP response, and then the closing of the TCP connection. Now, as you can imagine, this is extremely inefficient if you're making many, many HTTP requests. So, HTTP 1.1 came out with persistent connections, where you can make many HTTP requests for a single connection. You make the TCP handshake, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, and then request, response, request, response, request, response. This way you eliminate the overhead of that TCP handshake and, and destruction of that TCP connection. Excuse me the destruction of the TCP connection uh, per request and you, and you get you get many more requests and you don't you don't run out of sockets as easily but last possibly the most efficient way in HTTP 1.1 of communication was through HTTP pipelining and this is with still uh, many HTTP requests over a single TCP socket however the client doesn't wait for responses the client might say hey I want a B C D E I want all of these resources and the server as they get them says oh yes I have the I have the response to this I have the response to this I have the response to this as you can imagine uh, <laughs> it, it may be possible for either the client or the server to get confused um, if you have many different requests all one after the other the server must determine where one begins and where the other one ends and actually this is the core of the HTTP desynchronization vulnerability is a mismatch a, a, a miscommunication between certain HTTP appliances on how these are interpreted. Quickly, let's discuss architecture. Uh, we're going to, I mean, many times there's a front end, there's a back end. HTTP architecture can be complex. You're sending a request through your home router. It's going through the internet backbone, maybe, go, maybe going to um, a DMZ somewhere and, and being responded to by an HTTP server. It's not just, it's not just being, going to, uh, directly to an HTTP server, though. It might be going through a reverse proxy, maybe a couple different proxies, maybe an application server, and then maybe going to a web server on a different host. There's many different hops in, in this architecture. However, what we're going to abstract this to just for this, uh, the purpose of this talk is uh, a front end and a back end. Both appliances speak HTTP, but generally a front end is going to be some sort of proxy or load balancer. Uh, maybe an app server, and, and a back end might be a web server. So, so when I talk about the front end and the back end, these are HTTP appliances. They speak HTTP, and they are each handling your request, one passing to the other and one passing to the other, uh, all in the, on the quest for these, these user resources. So this is the abstraction we're going to use for the rest of the presentation. All right, finally, one last concept to cover about HTTP is message bodies. We talked about the first line. We talked about the, the, the verb, the path, and the, the version. We talked about the headers, which is essentially metadata about the request. And we, now we have the bodies. Like, how is data actually transferred? What is the data? What does it mean? The easiest way, to, the, the, the most primary way of uh, determining how large a, a payload is or, or how large a body is is content length. So in here, we have a, a, a request, a post request to test and it's uh, and, and in, in the body on line six, you see key value pairs. Oh, something to remember in HTTP is that the each line is not separated by a new line. A new line being one byte. It's actually separated by two bytes, which is a carriage return and a line feed. This is going to be important later when we're actually counting these bytes, and we're going to see what we're going to see how this causes a, a mismatch. However, after all those carriage return line feeds. Um, there's the actual post body, which are key value pairs in this point. There's also another method, which is multi-part form data. Some of you pen testers or anybody that's done a CTF might know of this particular way of transferring messages in HTTP. Um, this is where there's a special content type, which is in the content type metadata header, uh, and then parameters are outlined or defined by some sort of boundary. And then instead of key value pairs all separated by ampersands, you have key value pairs separated by a boundary, and usually this is used for a file upload. 
And then last, um, probably one of the most complex to wrap your minds around, and again, the other concept that is key to this particular vulnerability is transfer encoding chunked or chunked encoding. And this is used when messages cannot be determined in advance. Uh, normally, <laughs> normally, uh, this is used on the back end between server to server communication. It's, 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 primary, it's primarily used in that communication between the front end and the back end, in that back end HTTP architecture. Now, one of the interesting things is that since HTTP 1.1, remember this is 1998 when this, this spec was finalized, since then, it is mandated by the RFC, by the standard, that all applications, all appliances that speak HTTP 1.1 must also be able to understand chunked encoding. This is extremely important. Remember, everyone speaks chunked encoding, though you don't see it a lot. So in this, in this encoding, chunks are delimited by carriage return line feeds, again, again. Uh, and how do we know wh that we're using chunked encoding? Well, one of the headers, the uh, transfer encoding header, is set to chunked. Uh, the chunks each consist of the number of bytes, followed by carriage return line feed, and then the actual bytes. So in line five on the, on the diagram, we have seven bytes are to come, carriage return line feed, Mozilla, which is seven letters, seven bytes, and then carriage return line feed. And the next chunk is nine bytes, which is a developer. The next chunk is seven bytes, which is network. And then finally on line 11, we have the zero, which says no bytes to follow, end of message. Now this can be used in both HTTP requests and HTTP responses. And uh, it's, it kind of turns the HTTP protocol into a stream. And because of that, it's, it's, it's more efficient. However, um, this is just one other way that the HTTP body can be packaged inside an HTTP request. Let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about the vulnerabilities, all right? Some of y'all might have uh, heard of these. Uh, HTTP smuggling, what is it? HTTP splitting, that's a thing. And then HTTP desynchronization. For the purposes of this talk, uh, we're going to talk about HTTP smuggling and desynchronization in generally the same context. And though they are technically different, um, they are, uh, they, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to use them generally interchangeably. And I think, I think you can too in, in day to day. The first example I'll show is an actual HTTP smuggling vulnerability. And then the desynchronization is, is the much larger subset and uh, some really interesting vulnerabilities. This was first discovered in 2005, which I was blown away by. Um, the, white, the Watchfire team created a white paper. Um, I've got the link here in, in the uh, presentation, and I'll post these links uh, on Discord after. But Watchfire posited that HTTP uh, smuggling may be able to occur if uh, there was a difference in the, front, in the way the front end interpreted a specially crafted HTTP request. Uh, they wrote a white paper about it, and I'm going to get into their example in a bit. But first, 11 years later, um, this was the next time that HTTP uh, request smuggling was introduced uh, in actually DEF CON 2016, DEF CON 24. I've got the slides in here too. Uh, Regalero uh, came up with methods of causing a, an, uh, causing a desynchronization using differences in content length, how content length or transfer encoding chunked, chunked encoding headers. Um, he found vulnerabilities in a number of different, in a number of different um, uh, projects and appliances. However, he wasn't able to exploit it. Okay? He found the vulnerabilities. He was only able to identify these vulnerabilities in the debugging environment. And he was infamously quoted in, in, during DEF CON. He said, you will not earn bounties in HTTP smuggling. Fast forward three years to 2019. James Kettle, aka Albino Wax, uh, at Black Hat 19 and DEF CON 27. Uh, back in 2019, he released his research about HTTP desynchronization attacks. Uh, not only was he able to reliably weaponize this attack, but he was able to detect it as well. Because of this, um, he was able to rack up uh, a number of bounties. I think, I think PayPal paid him the most, but he earned 80K in bug bounties which he described as being used for Portswigger beer money. This is, yes, he was working for the Portswigger organization, which is the uh, develop, development organization for Burp Suite. And then two years later, uh, James Kettle also gave another presentation. His research collided with another's. Emil Lerner concurrently uh, identified that HTTP smuggling is also possible in HTTP 2. 
but we'll get into that a little bit later too. So what does this attack look like? Well, um, l let's use the Watchfire, the most simple example, which is from what the Watchfire team in 2005. Consider the following. We have a browser on one end. We have a web proxy, which kind of handles HTTP requests inside, uh, inside and out. It kind of redirects them. It has some caching as well. It might cache responses. And then it forwards things to the web server. The web server responds through the proxy and then goes back to the, the, the user's browser. So say we have a request that looks like this. Take a look at it. There's three different sections. There's a blue section, there's a purple section, and there's a, a red section. Notice anything funny about it? Well, those of you that are paying close attention would have noticed that there's two content length headers initially. So what does this mean? Well, when, the, when a web appliance gets this message, they have to determine where does the body begin and where does the body end? How many characters am I actually going to count out? Well, there's two ways to interpret this. Well, one is to use the very first header of zero and say, hey, there's no, there's no bytes in the post body. And the other way is to interpret it as there's 44 bytes in the post body. So which, which do you follow? Well, it, the HTTP spec says this is illegal and should be thrown out. However, not all appliances were coded this way. And the Watchfire team identified that two different HTTP appliances uh, by the same vendor, Sun1, interpreted this wildly different ways. Well, the, the first request, uh, if you interpret the very last content length header, uh, it consists of both the blue and the purple, where the purple would be the post body. In another another way to um, and so that, that would be that would all be the blue and the purple would all be request one. Now request two would be the red and and the what they found out was the web proxy interpreted it as such. However, when these were both forwarded to the the web server, something different happened. So here it's going down the pipeline. You see blue purple is one request and then red is another. Now, by the time this gets to the web server, the web server throws out any additional content length headers that it gets, and it only considers the first header. And so it thinks this first request has a content length of zero, which is no body. It, it, it interprets the purple uh, request as the very next request, which is a get request to poison.html. And uh, in line 10, uh, it's able to create put the first line of the red request inside of a header of the first. This is very clever. And so it still sees two requests, but now it sees a blue request first, and then a purple followed by a red body in the other. Well, what happened? So the proxy sees two requests, one a post request to foobar.html, and another request number two to login.html. The web server, on the other hand, will respond to a post request to foobar.html and respond with a different response. So why is this bad? Well, if an attacker goes and sends this crafted request uh, to login.html and the web server gives a response to poison.html, that may be cached in the web proxy. Uh, so where the next uh, victim requests a login.html, that cached response would get sent back to the victim. They'd get 404 not found. What they found is this could deliver a multitude of different attacks but, or, or cause denial of service. So there's denial of service, web cache poisoning. Um, it did not stop there. So next I'd like to get into uh, Albino Wax's research. And this is, again, this is Albino Wax's, James Kettle's research. And I, I, what I, what I want to do is uh, break it down for uh, everyone, out, everyone viewing out there. He came in, and, um, I, and, and, and please go to these uh, blog posts, read his white papers if you're interested in this. We're just going to scratch the surface on uh, HTTP desynchronization attacks. Uh, but one of the things I really like about this class of attacks is he makes it so that it is, um, it is so easy to wrap your mind around once, once you actually do it practically. Port Swigger has a wonderful lab uh, that outlines these. Let's talk through what an attack looks like in a desynchronization attack. So there's a front end and a back end, and an attacker sending requests down the pipe. And remember HTTP pipelining. All of those requests get jammed down the network pipe. And, and in order to determine where one begins and the other ends, some parsing has to be done. Now when the front end 
disagrees with the back end, remember they're both speak HTTP, when they disagree on how to parse these, that's when this vulnerability can occur. So this again is the same example from Watchfire just in this context. Say we have two content length headers, a six and a five. Well, which one does the front end interpret and which one does the back end interpret? If we have this orange X appended, that X would be six bytes, whereas the one, two, three, four, five would make five bytes. So what, what is the desynchronization uh, actually? Uh, where, where is this actually getting, um, where, where, where is the desynchronization happening? Well, it's happening between the front end and the back end if you disagree on how to handle this request. Say there's another green request at, at, that's, that's at the end. Well, the result, when the front end prioritizes this, um, the, the content length of six, and it thinks that the, uh, the blue and the orange is one request and the green is another, but when this goes to the back end, back end sees they prioritize the content length of five. And this sees a blue request and then X post. This X gets prepended to the very next request because of this desynchronization. So we're able to prepend data, arbitrary data, to the very next request in the queue. And in this case, it was the attacker's request. However, uh, if the attacker is able to make requests very fast, they could get prepended to an ar arbitrary victim. So a victim going to making a post request to example.com might actually receive a response for X post. Not, it, it, this, isn't, uh, this isn't really a, exploitable at this point in time, but you can see the implications of being able to, you should be able to see the implications of being able to change somebody else's request. Now if we do this in an intelligent fashion, if we get creative with it, we can actually cause exploitable behavior. Now let's put another layer of complexity. Remember that transfer encoding. We talked about pipelining, where we jam all the requests down the pipe. We need to determine where one begins and the other ends. However, uh, where does transjunct encoding fit into this? I'll show you. So remember, recall that content length or chunked encoding were both ways of determining where one request begins and the other ends. What if we send both? James Kettle did just this. Re remember the carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed. Well, in this example, in, in the CLTE um, example of, of this vulnerability, we sent a content length of six and a transfer encoding of chunk. Well, if the, the front end may see this as, uh, it may prioritize content length. It might not be chunked encoding aware. Even though the RFC says it must uh, understand what chunked encoding is and abide by it, it might not have been coded that way. So if the front end observes a content length of six, it's gonna, see, it's gonna count six bytes after the first carriage return line feed. It's gonna count the zero, carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, and then the X, that's six bytes. So it passes that all to the back end as a single request. Say a post request is sent directly after this, and this also gets forwarded to the back end. So what does the back end prioritize? The back end, back end might be chunked encoding aware. And so it interprets this as chunked encoding. Well, when it does, it looks for carriage return line feed and looks for the number of bytes uh, in the very next chunk, which is zero. And as you may recall from earlier in the presentation, when that's followed by a carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, uh, that ends the message. So there's this rogue X floating in here, it's floating in the HTTP pipe. What happens to it? Well, it gets prepended to the very next request, and that request in green does not get a response to post, it gets a response for X post, which is generally illegal. <laughs> and you're gonna get a 400 bad request for this. In the opposite way, what if, what if, there, what if the rules are switched? This is also exploitable, we'll show you how. Say the front end is chunked encoding where, but the back end is not. The back end's only going to understand content length. Well, if we, if we, if we send this message again, we have a content length of four and, and chunked encoding. So the front end sees, okay, chunked encoding, we're good to go. It follows the first uh, carriage return line feed, takes that 30F, we count out 30F bikes in hex, um, and that covers everything in orange. Trust me, I did the math. Um, and sends that on to the back end and sees the orange and the blue are a single request. Well, when that gets to the back end, the back end prioritizes content length, sees a content length of four and sees a post body of 30F and nothing else. So it sees this as two separate requests. Well, when the very next request comes down the pipe, whether that be a victim or the attacker's request, that orange message is gonna get prepended to the green one. And what's that, what that's gonna do is give the response of 
a post request to hopefully 404. It might have been a login request, it might have been a, a request to, to the database, it might have been an update, create, delete. Regardless of what that green victim sent, they're going to get a 404 response. So some of you might be putting the pieces together um, by now. You can influence random users uh, who are also using this application. You can prepend things to their requests. You can get arbitrary requests back from the application. Let's keep going. So um, we, we, we went over a CLTE and a TECL, two different variants of this attack that Kettle mentioned. Kettle came up with so many different bypasses. He tested essentially every bug bounty program for these, for these uh, vulnerabilities. And he found different bypasses with, with, where he could use X chunked. He could use different spaces, different tabs in different places. And, and he, be, with this, he was able to deduce uh, that maybe some appliances were just grepping for the transfer coding and the grepping for the word chunked. Some appliances were ignoring U lines, and some, some appliances were, were ignoring uh, tabs and, and carriage returns. And he was able to exploit this parsing behavior uh, to, to get these differences. And really, it's a difference of something in the front end versus something in the back end. And as an attacker, you really don't even need to know the entire architecture. You just need to know that, that usually uh, there's going to be different HTTP appliances and that they're going to react differently if you, if you fuzz them a little bit with this behavior. All right, let's get into practical exploitation. I have uh, four demos available. Those demos are available to download, um, and I'll, I'll give you the GIFs later. Uh, it's a zip file on the web server, and uh, there's a controls bypass first. Uh, this is demo number one, and I'm not going to actually show the demo for this. Uh, I would like to, to walk through this attack. Uh, it's going to be more of the same, but this is a fairly complicated attack path, and I really want you all to understand it. All right, so say there is a, um, in this, in this part example, we have a front end and a back end, and the front end disallows access to the slash admin endpoint. Well, if there is a HTTP smuggling or HTTP desynchronization vulnerability in between the front end and the back end of these servers, uh, it is possible to bypass this control and access the administrative portal from the internet. Um, that's the demo number one. However, let's talk about demo number two. Um, I'll give you demo number one later. However, demo number two, uh, since we're running low on time, I really wanted to cover this one. And this is a complete session takeover. So the goal in this uh, is to utilize a desynchronization to steal a victim user's cookies. So consider, again, a front end and a back end. And there's two requests we're going to craft. One is uh, the blue request, which is just a simple post. And then the orange request, which is an actual uh, Post, it's, a, it's HTTP which will post a comment in the application. Now, if this is a carefully crafted post request, um, let, let's, let's analyze this a little bit. So in the first blue request, we have two headers. We have a content length of 273 and transfer encoding of chunk. In this case, the front end processes content length, and the back end processes the transfer encoding. So when this, these um, requests go through the front end, the front end sees blue and orange as one request. And then the back end sees these as two different requests. Well, when the, the back end is going to give two different responses, but it's, there's going to be a desynchronization in place. So that 273 covers everything in the orange, and the chunked um, truncates this message immediately after the zero, because there's zero bytes in the next chunk per RFC. So the smuggled request is this orange request is getting smuggled within the blue and it's getting passed off to the back end. Well, we can combine this um, with a victim request. When this orange request gets to the back end, it's going to go in limbo. It's in the pipeline. It's, it's, it's kind of sitting in, in limbo because there's, there's going to be one request according to the, the, the middleware, the front end, and there's going to be one response. However, when this gets to the back end, it's going to be caught in limbo. And this orange request is going to get prepended to the very next request, which could be a victim request. Well, since this is uh, coercing, since, since this orange is carefully crafted, we're going to coerce the next victim to post a comment. We're going to post a comment as the attacking user. But if, if the attacker is able to see the content of this comment, uh, the content of the comment will be all of the victim's headers 
and the victim's request. And what we'll see is that this includes the victim's cookies, which is sufficient to take over their entire account. So if you want to follow along at home, um, the demo is available at www.hooperlabs.xyz slash demos.zip. Uh, this will be available for today only. Uh, let me know, uh, go ahead and DM me out, out of band if you want them otherwise. But that's where they are for now. And let's, let's take a look at them. One sec, let me pull up the demo. Right on. Okay, demo's up. Let's talk through this. Okay, so what we have, this is the Port Swigger Web Security Academy. Um, and so just like we talked about before, there we'll, we're gonna use a HTTP smuggling request to smuggle a request into the back end of this the server architecture and cause a desynchronization between a, a front end proxy and a back end web server. So I've got Burp Suite loaded up here and we, we're sending all traffic through this transparent pro, Burp Suite proxy. So I leave a comment on the website and when I hit post comment, it's gonna come up on Burp, uh, Burp Suite which, and, and we're gonna be able to see the HTTP protocol. So I, I made two copies, uh, the original post and then, and then we'll test for desync. And I'm gonna show you how to test for desynchronization here. Uh, I'm gonna clean up this request just to make it more readable. Let's clean this up and delete some of the headers. Yep, and we're just gonna make a simple post request uh, to the site just to see how it reacts. So with a content length of six, this is gonna encompass the entire post body. We should be getting a 200 okay. We get a 200 okay response every single time because this is a legal request. Now when we add a transfer encoding chunked header, we're introducing that complexity. We're saying, uh, and one header saying a content length of six, another saying chunked encoding. Now notice when I hit send over and over and over, I'm getting different responses. Why am I getting different responses? This is huge. This is the crux of how an HTTP a, a desync attack is uh, identified in the wild. If you, if you can craft a request such that you get different responses with the same input and different output, that's huge, right? That never happens. Uh, that's how you know there's some sort of desynchronization going on between the front end architecture and the back end. So next, now that we know a desync is occurring, uh, what we're gonna do is smuggle one request inside of the other. So we take that post comment request uh, and we're gonna smuggle it inside of this so that we cause the desynchronization that smuggled comment HTTP is gonna get prepended onto a random victim request. And let's take a look at it. It's not full screen. Oh, it's not, thank you. I'll try to get it, I'm trying to make it full screen for y'all. I lost it. I got it? Yeah, thanks. All right, now there's some guesswork involved here. Um, we're kind of guessing a content length, um, a content length for this because we don't know exactly uh, what the size of the victim comment will be. So there is some guesswork in here um, and that's, that's just how this attack goes. So we keep waiting for these, these HTTP responses. If we get two HTTP 200 responses in a row, whereas previously, remember, when we're causing that desynchronization, we get 200, 404, 200, 404. If we get two 200s in a row, then we know a victim has inserted themselves and our attack payload, this posting of a comment, is prepended to the victim. And we can check our work here in the uh, browser. Let's go down and there we go. And this is a comment, um, our smuggled HTTP was prepended to a random victim. And this random victim, we were able to co coerce this random victim to post a comment to our blog and we were able to steal their headers. We stole their cookies, we stole their headers, and now we can essentially masquerade as this user. Now that's just one, <laughs> that's just one, um, uh, that, that's just one, um, attack path for this, and there's actually many others. So let's let's take a look at what the possible impact could be, because uh, if you get creative, uh, we can change the HTTP of any victim request, almost however we want, but we can prepend any, any kind of arbitrary data. So if we can change the victim request, we can now coerce a server response. 
One of the limitations of this attack is that it's, it's non-discriminate. You cannot target anyone. You can target yourself if you send requests fast enough over the wire. However, this is just going to attack the random user coming in from, from Iowa or Michigan or, or, or Shanghai. This is not, you're not going to be able to target a specific user, but you can target an entire user base. Uh, if there's an open redirect uh, within the web application, you can coerce uh, a victim user to get redirected to an arbitrary URL. If there is reflected or stored or DOM cross-site scripting in, a, uh, in an application, even if it's self-XSS, uh, you can coerce that victim to uh, visit that vulnerable URL, to hit that vulnerable endpoint by prepending, remember, where uh, the, the data to, to hit that endpoint. And you can execute arbitrary JavaScript on, on the unsuspecting victim. You can deny service if you just keep doing this forever and ever. You can cause a permanent desynchronization. Uh, you can, as, we, as we saw, you can take over an account. And also, one thing that's interesting is uh, we were able to expose uh, not just the cookie headers, but you can also expose other hop-by-hop -hop headers. If you get real creative and you find an application where you're able to, um, to, to uh, uh, reveal the contents of that data back to yourself. So this is, this is one, uh, that was just one example, but the possibilities are really limitless and only limited to your, um, your creativity as a pen tester. And that's one of the reasons why I like this attack so much, is you, is you can really get creative. You can turn self-XSS into a, a severe vulnerability, you know, possibly a P1 for certain applications, for certain organizations. Uh, for, to, to actually exploit this, I'd recommend Burp Suite. Uh, Albino Wax works for Port Swigger, and he created the uh, Turbo Intruder and the HTTP Request Smuggler, both extensions that you can download and integrate within Burp. Specifically, the Python uh, Turbo Intruder mod, extender module uh, is extremely important, and the, the way that he was able to pipeline HTTP requests and, and reliably uh, de detect this in the wild. I have seen this in the wild. I've used these tools, uh, not just in the Port Swigger labs. Um, though it is becoming less common, I strongly encourage you to uh, either look in your organization with, with permission uh, <laughs> or, uh, or find a bug bounty program and, and, and play around with this. You can also go on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy to, to play around with it yourself. Let's talk about detection and mitigation uh, because this is extremely important. We got real deep and real fast. We talked about some of the basics of HTTP. We talked about um, how we talked about the kind of the history of request smuggling and the differences in how some HTTP appliances may interpret HTTP requests. But what is the root cause, right? You, you may have gotten lost in all that, but the root cause essentially is in a pipeline, a uh, number of different HTTP requests all smashed together. The differences in how some sort of front end and back end architecture might interpret these requests, the differences in how they interpret it can cause this vulnerability. What it does is it gonna, it's gonna cause a desynchronization. Now a lot of times, more times than not, this desync is gonna result in a denial of service or it's gonna result in um, you know, errors. However, in some scenarios, you're able to you, we are able to detect that this is a, an exploitable opportunity. And so how do we prevent this behavior? Well, well, number one, the RFC says anything that does not follow the RFC, throw it out. You know, automatic 400. Not every appliance follows the RFC. Not every programming language follows the RFC. I, I, what, we, what we found uh, very reliably more times than not is that when these third-party vendors, they, they may have a loose understanding or just want things to just work. So they're, they're very lenient. And when there's leniencies in different areas, that's when, that's when this uh, vulnerability actually, actually occurs. So how do I know if uh, an appliance I have is vulnerable? Well, one, you're gonna look for CVE. First and foremost, patching will help this. Uh, when this was identified in 2019, a number of CVEs came out. A number of CVEs came out even before then when Reed Valero in DEF CON 24 uh, identified these as well. So, so, so first and foremost, if you're a consultant and you're worried about this or your, your client is worried about this, you, know, you can always patch. You can always look for the CVEs. Uh, you can always inspect for, source, for, for RFC compliance. Uh, 
though doing that is very tedious, right? You'd have to go through, you'd have to go through and program something, uh, maybe even another piece of middleware to go into every single request, every single packet, and inspect it, make sure it, it, it's, you know, it's not a bad packet. That's not really, uh, that's, that's not really feasible, is it? However, um, we'll, we'll get to that later. And then uh, another one is source code analysis. Uh, a lot of vendors don't have open source uh, within, their, within their appliances, but you can always inspect the source code and see what's going on in the middleware, what's going on in every single hop, and are these appliances handling chunked versus uh, content length encoding differently. Mitigation, uh, HTTP2 is always better for backend connections. Uh, this limits in some way uh, the ability to, re to smuggle requests. However, it, I would highly encourage you to, to look at Emil Lerner's and, and uh, Albino Wax's research into HTTP2 smuggling. Essentially, uh, if you know these basics in this presentation, uh, you can utilize the same attack principles to smuggle requests inside of headers, even the compressed headers. You can smuggle requests inside the header keys or the header values or even the body. And both, each of them found different ways of doing so. So HTTP2 is not the end all be all. Now you can patch, we talked about that already. You can strictly enforce the RFC, you know, send bad packets straight to RFC jail or just drop entirely. Um, uh, but the one tool I did want to highlight because I've heard that it works wonders is this H AWS HTTP desync guardian. And essentially what this does is it is an appliance that sits uh, and, and runs in HTTP middleware and it inspects RFC for you. If something is not RFC compliant, you can either set it to you know, pass or, 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 um, or deny or, uh, or just log. And I, I think it's a wonderful tool and it's open source. So, so take a look at that on, on GitHub. That was a lot, let's review. So first of all, the HTTP 1.1 protocol came with two main features that made this exploit or this vulnerability possible. And one is chunked encoding, the ability to, to have some sort of turn HTTP into a stream with this transfer encoding chunked heading. HTTP pipelining, which uh, was a form of TCP connection reuse where we could send multiple different HTTP requests all on the same TCP socket and we didn't have to wait for the responses of each. Another key concept is that these crafted smuggled requests may cause desynchronization between web servers and web components and web appliances. That the differences in interpreting these HTTP streams that, uh, that you know, that we want them to go faster, we want them to go better, we want, we want there to be less overhead in all of this communication. Well, when a desynchronization occurs, sometimes this, this might be exploitable. And, and these unplanned, this unplanned behavior can cause a really out of this world vulnerability where you're able to control as an attacker or uh, you're able to control the, the content of victim requests. You're able to control the content that the server res, uh, responds to this victim. So some questions to you is, is one, like where else might this behavior be found? Uh, might you find it in uh, social engineering engagement, right? Would you, would you find it in real life? Would you find it in other protocols where there's some sort of mismatch where one protocol is interpreted versus uh, another is? Or different technologies or even maybe in, in uh, your local bureaucracy? Can your organization detect these? Uh, as I stated before, they're, they're, uh, like patch management's gonna help. Uh, in addition to patch management, um, you know, having something that abides by the RFC or actually inspects the RFC will help as well. But, but knowledge is power a lot of times, and what might help most in securing the organization is teaching them that these vulnerabilities exist and that this is actually a possibility. I wanna thank you all. Um, thank you, uh, John, Isaac, everyone. Really appreciate you, and um, thank you for your time, you the listener. Uh, I appreciate your time, I appreciate your ears. Please uh, come out on Discord for a Q&A. Let's talk about uh, tech. Let's talk web application vulnerabilities. Let's talk uh, desync attacks. Thank you, and uh, I really appreciate your time.